I always love talking about scientific advances, but sometimes it's important to think back about the history that made that possible. So to begin with, for today's talk about atomic theory, we need to think first about the beach. Ah, oh, the beach, such a wonderful place to be. But Democritus and also Elusipus were along with him thought about the beach more than just its beauty and nature. They thought if you look at the beach from far away, then it looks like it's a continuous object. But if you zoom in and you get closer, you can pick up the sand and you can see that it's composed of, inf of little discrete units of grains of sand. So just like that today, we've learned that you can zoom in even more and you can see individual pieces even within the grain of sand. And if we could zoom in even more, we would notice that there's these things called atoms. And so Democritus long before the development of a microscope, is able to think about the point that, hey, if we divide something like iron, eventually we'll get to the point where we'll have individual atoms of iron, and at that point, matter can no longer be subdivided. He also thought that the same thing could apply to fire or earth or wind, um, which are things that everybody thought that the all matter was composed of was these four elements that of fire air water or earth but he thought if you break down fire you're gonna get atoms of fire so he was good with his idea but we have since gone a little further um, but he really proposed this first idea but unfortunately for him there was another philosopher at the time who had a little more popularity and so he ended up saying ah those ideas are rubbish in fact matter is continuous, there's these things called atoms, those things don't exist, that's silly. If we look at the beach, it all is earth. Why do we need to think about this any further? And since he was a big name, people listen to him. It's sort of like today. The bigger your name is, the more likely people will listen to you. Why else do you think whenever people are trying to sell like a drug um, or something through a commercial, they have people wear a lab coat? Because the idea would be is if you're a big name, if you're viewed as an intelligent human being, people are more likely to listen to you. And unfortunately, what was true then is still true now. So then we get to go forward to the Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment was really started in about the 18th century and is driven by skepticism, which we still have not, you know, refrained from, which is fantastic. Skepticism is a wonderful thing. Um, but they were really skeptic about traditional ideas and beliefs. Really, it was a desire to make society, politics, and technology improve. And so they became really curious and were trying to figure out how can we understand what's going on in the world a little bit better. Um, and so wonderful time, um, especially in Europe, it really kind of went like crazy up in Europe. Um, but throughout this time, remember, people didn't have the ability to Instagram or Snapchat or just send a text message to their collaborators. They would have to write it down. So I love this quote from the book. Chemistry was a collective, but not necessarily collaborative achievement of a number of contemporaries, meaning they all worked together, but not necessarily side by side, um, but they were contemporary, so it was all around this time, this era, um, but it was all possible because of written communication, so if they wouldn't have written these ideas down and like published them, um, their era, so somebody in Sweden versus somebody in France, they wouldn't have been able to discuss. So scientists did always build on the knowledge of those before them, so they would build on these ideas by Democritus, by Aristotle, um, by the alchemist but they weren't necessarily working hand in hand. Whereas today, you know, if Stephen Hawking, back when he was alive, if he tweeted something out, people would immediately read it and it was instantaneous. Whereas today, you might have to wait months or years to, hand, to hear about some science that has happened. So the first scientist I want to talk to you about during this Age of Enlightenment was the Lavoisiers. Um, and I love that the book, you know, mentions both Antoine and Marie. And so the idea is, is they both contributed a great deal of their work to this idea of atomic theory. Um, to give you a little history on them, um, they were from a wealthy families. Um, and at this time, they lived in France, and it was during the French Revolution, um, which was not the time where you wanted to be a wealthy the um, aristocrat, especially not a tax collector. So Antoine was a tax collector. That's how he paid the bills. But basically, he did his day job to make it so he could do science at night. Um, they both enjoyed. And what you see here is uh, even Marie working in the laboratory with her husband. They worked together to develop a whole lot of the foundations for the law of conservation of mass. And so him being a tax collector, he was really good at weighing and balancing. So meaning 
keeping records, you know, doing audits, making sure that every cent was accounted for. So that being said, when he did chemistry experiments, he was very, very particular in weighing things. So that means that if you were weighing, um, in this case, mercuric oxide before, and then you did an experiment, and then you got mercury and oxygen out of it, most people would say, I lost mass because I only have 92.61 grams remaining. But he collected the mass, even the gas and he realized that no, during any chemical change, matter is not created nor destroyed, which means if you have 100 grams before the experiment, you should have 100 grams after. But it was due to his meticulous nature, specifically in accounting, that made him such a fantastic chemist. Unfortunately, like I mentioned before, it was during the French Revolution, which means he was beheaded. Uh, so before he really reached even the prime of his experiments, he was gone. He was... He was um, like I said, beheaded. beheaded. Um, but his wife, she went ahead and collected all, because she, she tried really hard to, you know, obviously fight for that not to happen. Um, and But she was very mad at the end of it, and she took all of his records and tried to really explain them more fully and publish them so everybody could see the fantastic work that they had done together. And it's because of this work that we're able to give him credit for a large amount of stuff that he had done. Um, and a lot of scientific couples were like this. They would work together, um, like the Juliot Curies or Marie and, um, and Pierre Curie in the lab. They would work together um, and can really contribute a lot to the work that they were doing. So here on the right-hand side, you really see kind of the modern-day application of this. You have a balance, and on that balance is some reaction happening. But if you put a balloon on it, now you can see that not only did the, the clear liquid change to a solid, but some gas was produced. So law of conservation of mass. Matters not created nor destroyed. So then later on we have Joseph Proust. And so this is a Frenchman who actually moved to Spain. Um, so like many scientists, his work was uh, cut short a little bit. He had moved to Spain and was doing excellent work in the lab. But then unfortunately Napoleon invaded Spain, burned his lab to the ground, and forced him to go back to France. Uh, but at least his didn't end um, finale, you know, finally in, in, in Spain. He was able to go back to France. And he published this work and he discussed this work on the law of definite proportions. So this law is that a compound always contains the same elements in certain definite proportions. So basically the idea would be, here is this chemical formula. So the idea would be there's one copper, two of these OH groups, which are called hydroxides, and one of these carbonates, which is a carbon with three oxygens attached to it. And so if you have copper carbonate anywhere in nature, it doesn't matter how it looks, it's still the exact same ratios. And so that's what he really worked on proving. Um, another way to show this is this Berzelius experiment, where Berzelius took lead and sulfur and combined it in a bunch of different ratios. And he combined them in this exact ratio, which we will end up calling molar ratio later on. Um, it produced lead sulfide. But if you had a little bit extra sulfur, then what do you know? You produce the exact same amount of lead sulfide, but now you have some leftovers. Then if you produce it with extra lead, same amount of sulfur, same amount of lead sulfides produced, but you have some of the lead left over. So the idea is you, you need a certain amount of each material to react in order to produce the final product, and that they always just react in equal amounts. Now notice it's equal molar amounts, which we'll get to in the next section, not equal gram amounts. So another experiment that helped prove the law of definite proportion was done by Cavendish. And so what he did was he, electrol he did the electrolysis of water, which means basically he hits water molecules with a whole bunch of electricity. This is a really fun experiment that you can actually do in your home. Um, and so what you do is you take a clear plastic cup like this one and you stick two thumbtacks into the bottom of it like this. So that way they're separated about the equal spacing as a 9 volt battery. And then you can fill it with, with water, but you need to have an electrolyte. So if you have like a clear Gatorade or just Gatorade in general, you can fill that water cup up with water or you could do like water mixed with vinegar. Um, really anything that gives you a little bit of molecules. You need a little extra hydrogen in that water. Um, but so I know vinegar works really fantastic. And then all you do is you place this um, this 9 volt battery at the bottom of the cup. And so each prong is touching one of the prongs of the 9 volt. And what happens is 
the same thing that happens in this fancy apparatus here. Nobody has this fancy apparatus, but you probably have a 9-volt battery and cups and thumbtacks. And so you'll start to see water literally breaking apart. And it's so cool because you'll see air bubbles. But on one of the prongs, you'll see a whole bunch of air bubbles. And on the other prong, you, the other prong with the thumbtack, you won't see hardly any. And the reason for that is because you're producing two times as much hydrogen gas as you are oxygen. And so on each of the thumbtack prongs, you're producing a different chemical or a different atom really. It's going to be H2 or O2 and you're going to produce twice as much of the hydrogen gas as you're going to be producing of oxygen. And it's really kind of cool to see. And so separately from um, his contemporaries here of Berzelius and of Proust, he was able to determine the exact same thing. That these atoms have to combine in certain definite proportions, in water's case two to one, or else it's a different molecule. All right, so then we moved into John Dalton. So he is an English chemist, and he was educated into the old age of 11. Um, he was actually a poor Quaker who lived pretty modestly. In fact, the Royal Society really, really, really wanted him to join. Um, that was kind of the who's who's of science of the day. Um, but he did not want to because you had to pay dues in order to join. And so they went ahead and voted and paid his dues without his knowledge and making him a part of the Royal Society, even though he did not want to be. Um, um, but he could, did some fantastic contributions to science. He considered Lavoisier's work, which came in and think back to good old unpopular Democritus. And with that foundation, he developed the atomic theory. And we're going to look at it more here in a second. He also developed the law of multiple proportions. So with law of multiple proportions, you've got the idea that not only are atoms combined in certain ratios, like the, the law we just looked at, but that maybe there's multiple possibility for ratios. So what you see here in this picture is this is dry ice, carbon dioxide. And so carbon dioxide is fantastic. It makes us so we can cool drinks down. It can be that fizziness in your in your pop or your soft drinks. Um, it's, it's a fantastic um, solid or gas. But if it's carbon monoxide, just the smallest bit of carbon monoxide can kill you. And the only difference between carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide is that carbon combines either in carbon dioxide in a two to one, so one carbon for every two oxygens, or carbon monoxide is one carbon for every one oxygen. And that's a huge difference between something that is extremely drinkable and something that can kill you. So here's another example of that multiple proportions. Nitrogen and oxygen can combine in a couple different ways. Here is one oxygen, two nitrogen, or one and one, or two oxygens for every one nitrogen. And so it's just kind of the idea that elements can combine in many different ways, but each of these different molecules has completely different properties, and that's very interesting. All right, so then we have Dalton's atomic theory. Now the thing that's really interesting to me is the fact that you have his original theory and then over here, we have a lot of this that's still to this day true. Um, he said matter is indestructible particles called atoms um, and they're indivisible, um, but atoms can be divisible and we'll learn more about those protons, neutrons, and electrons later on. Um, and then he said elements are made of just one type of element that is unique to that element. Um, but now we know a little bit more about isotopes um, and so I atoms can be slightly different but we won't really worry about there but it's pretty much the same the same law still good and then down here compounds are formed when atoms of different elements combine in fixed proportions that's still 100 percent true and then here a chemical reaction involves a rearrangement of atoms but there is no breaking destroying or creating of atoms and the reason this is slightly modified is because this is true for chemistry chemical reactions but not nuclear nuclear you're going to actually break the stuff down and so you're going to break atoms apart. Um, but I love this because he did all of this work without really understanding what electrons were, having an electron microscope to actually see the atoms. He made all of these ideas just being able to see things change in chemical reactions and that's so impressive to me. So what I want you to do now is go read section 2.4 and 2.6.